Yeah, hello. I want to touch on the topic. I don't practice tight, tightening or a tight, but rather I practice giving more than 10% to the church. I understand there are debates, arguments and differences especially since the charismatic movement and now prevailing in West African countries such as Nigeria, Ghana and other places, especially among the uh, Nigerian community all over the world. So I want to address it by the grace of God. So first I'm going to state or stipulate my beliefs about this tight thing, the 10% giving to the church. And as I stipulate my points, of course, the burden of proof or the honors will be upon me to prove or to establish my points. So number one, I believe that the tithe is still relevant, but for the Christian, the tithe is just a guide. The tithe is just a guide. The tithe, Bible says, the law is like a tutor, a school teacher. So the tithe guides you of how to give. Number two, I believe under the New Testament, believers are supposed to give more than 10%. That's why I don't practice the tithe. I practice more than the tithe. Christians are supposed to give more than 10%. Three, I believe that the law is still good. The law is still good. Next, grace demands more from us, more than the law. Grace demands more from us, more than the law. Next, I believe that God wants us to give generously. That means more, to give more, to give more to the church. Why? So that the work of God will continue, the kingdom of God will expand. Next, I believe that the devil doesn't want the church to do more. Next, I also understand that there is so much abuse in the ministry among preachers. There is so much extremes and abuse in the ministry. I understand in terms of finances. Next, I, I believe that preachers, pastors must be paid and taken care and should be well taken care, uh, care of. So these are some of my basic beliefs. Now, to argue my points, to argue my points, I want to establish certain things. Number one, the God of the Old Testament is not a God of law. He is a gracious God, a God of grace, who relates with people based upon covenant. And that covenant is enforced through law. The same gracious God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament who is gracious God relates with people through covenant and the covenant is enforced through law. The difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament covenant is that the, in the Old Testament the law that enforces the covenant was written on stones or tablets whilst in the New Testament the law is written in the hearts or in the spirits of believers. That's the So in the Old Testament, there's law. In the New Testament, there's law. The word covenant means an agreement between God and man. And it's God that initiates the whole covenant by himself. That's why it's not a contract. It is a covenant. In contract, there must be offer, there must be acceptance, and it's, it must be, and it's legally binding. It's a legal relationship. But when it comes to covenant, is the creator, the supernatural being, 
He initiates a relationship with man based upon promises. But in the midst of the promises and the benefits, there are also obligations. And obligations cause into bear or into play the law. That's why we are the law. God, the law will reinforce this covenant. God calls Abraham. He said, walk before me. This, this, this. Obligation. And he said, do this, do this. And I'll bless you. I'll bless them that bless you. I'll curse them that bless you. So God promises Abraham. So the same covenant. Now, for us to do justice to the scripture, to the things I've said, the word contest or contextualization is very, very important. In the Old Testament, remember, Israel was not only a religious nation. Israel was also a state. Or, or it was a governmental nation. That deals with constitution. So as Israel, as a religious body, there were ceremonies, ceremonies, and there are some moralities. As Israel, as a state, there were civil laws. <laughs> there were civil laws as well as ethics. And there were some overlapping of some of the civil laws and the moral laws. Because in every nation, some of the civil laws, some of them may overlap with their decision. So, when the Bible talks about law in the Old Testament, we are thinking about at least three classifications. The classification of law in the Old Testament is at least divided into three components. Moral law. Moral law has to do with uh, justice, uh, righteousness, kindness, goodness, not st uh, stealing and those things. That are moral laws. Moral law stems out of the character of God. God is just. God is love. God is truth. So that's where the moral law comes from. And there is ceremony, ceremonial laws. Ceremonial laws has to do with religion. The temple. About sacrifices. About uh, animal sacrifices. About giving. About tithes. About offering. That is also there. And there is civil. Civil law has to do with the nation of Israel as a political nation, as a state. Now, when you, you trans, transpose these laws into the New Testament, the civil law is abolished in the New Testament. It's up to individual nations of the world who think maybe they're a Christian nation to adapt some of the laws. But if we don't understand this, that is why there's so much controversy. Some people say, oh, the law is passed when it suits us. Example, in the Old Testament, the Bible says that uh, materials for sewing clothes, there should not be a mixture of different materials. This is not a moral law. It is not a law that is everlasting. This was just a nation. So it was a dress code. Example, they were not supposed to eat some uh, seafood, like uh, I think prawns, uh, lobster, and the rest. These were not moral laws. In other words, this does not determine whether you go to heaven or not. These were uh, uh, dietary, dietary laws that in, 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 indirectly is connected to civil laws. In other words, they are regulations that helps the nation of Israel to work in good health. Who knows? Maybe God realized in those times that the same way demons could be driven into pigs. Maybe, maybe, I'm just a speculation. That God knew that those times some people or the nations around were worshipping or they saw maybe uh, prawns and uh, lobsters as symbols of idols or worship or maybe some Ebola or AIDS disease has influenced them. God was the king of Israel as, as a state and God was also the minister of health. God was the minister of transport. God was the minister. Remember, it was a theocracy as opposed to democracy. In democracy, power to the people. In a theocratic nation, power to God. In other words, God is the one. Minister, minister of this, minister of finance, minister of that. That's why it's God who have to 
decide how finances have to be run in the nation and the rest. Have to give them the advice. Now, if we understand this, that's what I'm saying that, then you can contextualize words. When you see a word in the law, like Romans uh, Psalm 1, it say, this, it say, this book of the law should not depart out of your mouth, but meditate upon it. This book of the law, what does that mean? It meant scriptures. Joshua 1, you meditate upon verse 8, meditate upon the word day and night, to be careful to do, is the word. Jesus says, set the scriptures, for in them you think you have life. That scriptures, remember there was no New Testament. So that scripture Jesus referred to was the Old Testament. So the word law, without understanding that Israel was not just a church or a religious body, Israel was also a state. So some of the laws are not applicable to the church now, like civil laws. But when it comes to moral laws, it does not change. In the Old Testament, that shall not steal. In the New Testament, that shall not steal. In the Old Testament, that shall not murder. In the New Testament, that shall not murder. But the difference is that when it comes to grace, grace demands more. That is why I practice giving more than 10%. The law was a tutor, our schoolmaster. In school, we are taught how to dress, how to do this. The school didn't teach those teachers those things for us to go and abandon them, but rather to develop and become better people. So the law was, Bible was a guide, was a schoolmaster to help us to do better, to do more. So we, later you are going to find out in the Bible, I'm going to give you scriptures, as a student of law, are based things on evidence and examples. You come to realize that the law, the example, in the Old Testament, adultery means having an extramarital affair or going for somebody's wife or husband and having affair, sexual intercourse with the person. In the New Testament, Jesus said, but I say to you, Matthew chapter 5, that if even you look at somebody from verse 21 going, even if you look at somebody lastfully, you last in your heart, you see maybe a nice man or a nice lady, and the word last is yes, contemplation, meditation in your mind, and you desire, you covet that person, without even talking to the person, without having any physical contact, without any even phone call or uh, SMS or whatever, Bible says that you have already committed adultery. So the question is, grace and law, which demands more? In, in, Old, in Old Testament, murder. When you hate your brother or sister, your brethren, hate, and you contemplate, contemplate the hatred in your heart, Bible says you've already committed murder. In the New Testament, physically, the person should be killed for murder liability to be brought against you. So my question again, the Old Testament and the New Testament, which one demands more? Law and grace. Grace demands more. Now, to help you, there's the word contest. Another way to help you, help us understand the scriptures, as I say, you don't have to be a theologian, I'm a student of theology, but you don't have to, is use Bible commentaries on the internet. Just Google. Example, you pick Matthew 23, 23, you Google it and add Bible commentary. Matthew 23, 23, Bible commentary. It will give a lot of, in other words, the information are the views of academic scholars. Or you can go to Google Scholar and Google that. Why? Because there are authorities in every field. When I, I say to people, when I have an issue with electrical issues or medical issues, I call my friends or relatives who are doctors when it's medical issue. When it's about electrical issue, I call my friends who are of electrical, uh, they are experts in the field of uh, ele 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 electricity or electrical issues, and I ask them for advice. It is only in the body of Christ, in the church, that people don't ask people who are qualified in the field of Bible and theology. But every Christian and church member assumes they know more than any other Christian on earth. Go on the social media, WhatsApp, Facebook. People's comment tells you that every Christian, even unbelievers, even Muslims, believe that they know the Bible more than everybody. And I don't think that's the right attitude. I have 
Kerry Bosch children. Some of them are good in design, some of them are good in economics. So when I've issue about some of the topics, I do ask them. I don't say because I'm a student of theology, a student of psychotherapy, a student of law, so it does it so that I know better than them. No. I respect their office. And that is one of the I think problem in the body of Christ. The Bible, remember, was not written in chapters and verses. It was theologians, scholars, or students of theology that divided the Bible into chapters and verses. If you, when it comes to the books of the Bible, what we call the canonization of the Bible, you think the, the Bible came the way you see your book, the Bible? No, it was not so. There were parchments, different segments, but, uh, pieces of the Bible. But theologians came together and based upon the principle of canonization and inspiration, they were able to do justice to the Bible that we have. So you cannot ignore the contribution of Bible scholars or students of theology. And I'm flowing in that aspect as a student of theology and also so as somebody of the grace of apostleship. Now, I suggest this is when people bring their own interpretation into the Bible, eyes, their views, their own opinion, their backgrounds, their feelings, their, sent their sentiments, they use that to interpret the Bible and to apply the Bible. It's a wrong way. The right way is what we call exegesis. Exegesis is when you explain the Bible. If you are a theologian, I'm a student of ex uh, Greek, a student of Hebrew, and how to use it. If you don't know Hebrew and this, you can use what we call the English Lexicon Bible or the English Hebrew Lexicon. You can also use all this as tools to interpret the Bible. You don't need all. The basic one you need is Bible commentary. That will help, and you must know the source. It's not every Bible commentary. It's just just like you, you want a data information about uh, the uh, the this uh, uh, information about uh, uh, UK stats about UK. You can't just pick it from any source from the internet. You want it from the government source, the government website. You have the right source. So I want to encourage as many of us, of course, I know we all want truth. And I know some of us, so longer we know, some of us, we are fighting with certain things that for us we believe it is truth, but it may be error. You know, in psychotherapy, there's something called false guilt, guilt. You can have a belief system, you believe something, and because of that, when you break that thing, you feel guilty. But the fact that you felt guilty about it does not mean that what you believe is right. Ladies, some ladies I know, they never put on lipstick or makeup because it was sent for them, some Christian sisters. But now they do. Ask them. The first time they put on lip, lipsticks or makeup, or the ladies who didn't put on trousers, the first time they put on trousers, ask them how they felt. They felt guilty. Not because the lipstick or makeup is wrong, but because of their belief system. It was based upon what they called a uh, false guilt, you know, and a lot of the, some of the doctrines we are speculating or fighting, we are so emotional about them, it is based upon false doctrine, false guilt. In other words, we think it is right, and I respect you for your belief system. That, in other words, when you believe the truth, you are going to fight for it. That is a good thing. That is why I'm also here to present the truth. Because obviously, you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Hosea as it says, for says that my people perish for lack of knowledge. What we don't know may be what is hurting us. When I was back in Africa, you can't whistle in the night. It was a taboo, super, I mean, kind of superstition. If by accidentally you whisper in the night, you feel guilty. You may think that the gods are going to strike on you. But it was a false, based upon false premises. The foundations was wrong. And a lot of beliefs we have, like believe that the law has passed. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law. I didn't come to do away. And Jesus Christ said, none of the law will pass away until this earth and heaven pass away. 
So the question is, has the earth passed away? No. Has the earth passed away? No. But in that context, Jesus was not referring to civil law. He was referring to moral law, justice, kindness. It of course it is the nature of God. When it comes to ceremonial laws, offerings, and the rest, it has to go through the cross. And I've said, argument from silence. You can't say argument from silence in law. You can't say, example, the apostles didn't speak much about law because they didn't speak much about tight. Because they didn't speak much about tight, that means there's no more tight. No, no, no. Legally, it doesn't work that way. It could be or it may not. So we have to ask certain critical questions, critical analysis. The question is, all the disciples were Jews. And they, when they were born again, they were, even when Christ ascended, they were still practicing some of the Jewish ceremony. They would go to the synagogue. Even Jesus Christ, Bible says, as his customs was, he would go into the synagogue, he would go into the temple. He, they, they were... I mean, involved in some of the ceremonial activities. The only one that they were not involved was the one that Christ has come to fulfill it, and Christ have declared that that is over. Because of I don't have my time, I would have dealt with the word inculturation. The word inculturation means that when Jesus Christ came, he came to abolish certain laws, example, civil law. Some laws he did not abolish them moral laws and some laws especially in the area of the ceremonial laws temple laws religious laws he came to adapt some of them and lift it to next level higher level and one of the ones he lifted to higher level in the body of christ is tight that's why tight is just for baby christians tight is a guide you must, as a Christian and as a believer, I want to give more. Anywhere there is grace, you look in the New Testament, I'm going to give you some scriptures. Anywhere there is grace, the apostles, the early church, they saw the demand, the need to give more. Have you give, sold your house before? Let's take UK, for instance, or America. The average house, three bedroom or two bedrooms, about 250,000 pounds. 250,000 pounds. A land. Also could call 200,000, 100,000, but even in Africa, in Ghana, there's some place called Trasaco Valley and the rest. When you buy a house, the land is not included. You have to buy, buy the land separately. And some of the lands are $100,000 and the rest. Just the land. And the, when there was grace in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, the Bible says that people sold their houses. They sold their land and they gave it. So the question is, why didn't they say, oh, I'm just going to sell and give 10%? But they give more because under grace, grace demands more. So quickly, I don't want to speak, I don't want to spend much time when I do YouTube because people don't want to spend so much time absorbing. Now, so there is Bible says that a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord. One of the reasons why there's false balance because you know, during the charismatic church in the early beginning. A charismatic movement. The itinerary preachers will go and preach at other places, do two weeks or one week or one month revival. The host will give them a place to sleep in their home. They will have food to eat. But most of the time, after that, they are not giving anything. Or even if they are giving anything, they are giving money for transportation. But these were full time ministers because some of them, they believe that when they had the call, they must be full time. You know, that's why now I advise young preachers. One of my associates, please, I have to go and start a church for him, not as a branch. I said to him, before we do that, I want you to get a job. I don't want you to go and start the church first under pressure. That every week you want to put demand and pressure upon the church. That, that you know, will spoil your preaching. Get a job, start it. At the right time, the, God settle, the church settles and stable. And you have enough people that the church is able to pay you. Then you go for salary because the laborer is worthy of his salary. But right from the beginning, it shouldn't be. So anyway, so in those times, the itinerary preachers will go and preach. And they will come back home just with a transportation fee, get home. They, they can't feed their children. They can't feed their wife. They can't pay bills. So it was so much frustration. That's why a lot of pastor students started rebelling, leaving the house. They didn't want to know about the Jesus of their father. Because they thought the Jesus of their father or the God of their father has taken their father from them. 
they can see their father to have uh, communion and fellowship with them, and also that their father is not bringing much money, and they are living poor. Because of that, because of that, the charismatic itinerary preachers now started charging. In other words, if you invite me, before I come, we have to negotiate. I'm going to charge you maybe $2,000 or $10,000, $5,000. I'm going to ahead or some of the charging preachers charge. Then, if it's $10,000 before I come, you have to first send me $5,000. Then, after preaching, you give me the $5,000. And some of them will give under condition and I'll raise money in the church. So, out of the one extreme of pastor's suffering, they came up with all these strategies to make sure that their family were not suffering. So they began to move to another extreme. So most charismatic preachers that came up, they saw what the elders were doing. They were, they were, they are heroes. So they started doing the same thing. So a lot of preachers, some of the offerings they give, not that, as far as they are concerned, they think it is right. They learned it from well-seasoned men of God. So they flow with that. But my point is that out of the one extreme, the pastors and ministers also began to go at the extreme. To the standard, if some pastors, when they go to minister another church, the host pastor and the guest pastor, they conspire to take offerings from the church so that they will share. Either the host pastor will take the offering for the guest pastor, or the guest pastor will take the offering for the host pastor. Then behind the scene, they will share the money. So these are some of the things that began to happen after the early church in the first century to the middle church. That's when the universal church became so corrupt that they have to even sell everything in the church. You know, so that's, that's another extreme. But now there's also another extreme. The other extreme now is that even people don't want pastors to be paid. People don't want pastors to be cared for. But you know, the Bible says that the pastor is worthy of double wages, double honor. In the context of that, the word honor, it was talking about money. It is that ministers are worthy. You see? And the law of scripture, Jesus Christ talks about the fact that uh, the servant or the laborer is worthy of his wages. Okay? So, you see that extreme. So, now, there's now, now extremes. And there's so much anger against ministers. But sad to say, most of the ministers, some of them who are doing the, all the uh, bad things in finances in the church, most of them are not even Christian. They are not born again. Some of them were, they are bad, they are fetish priests. Some of them are some street ninjas and gangsters. But they realize that, oh, there's money in the church. So let me also go for some black powers or occultism powers, get a Bible, then also become powerful and get money in the church. So a lot of preachers are not even born again. They are not Christians. And there are some born again good Christians. What they do, they didn't know any better. That's what they learned. They saw all the men of God. My background from Ghana, among the charismatic, almost all the well-known charismatics do. There's nothing different. You know, they all do raise money, raise money, and the rest. I, this is my background, maybe a little bit. In my church, I don't let guest preachers come and raise money in our church. When I go and preach somewhere and the guest preacher asks, oh, can you raise or do the offering? I tell them, please, you do it. I, will, I prefer not to do it. Two, when we have conferences, the church budget for the conference. So it's not now that during the conference, we have to raise the money to, to meet the, uh, the need of the conference. And the sad thing is that sometimes the church has money. So if the church has money, why do you have to raise money always for every conference? Why don't you budget ahead of time? If you don't have enough money to budget, sometimes you don't need to bring preachers that will cost the church hundreds of thousands of pounds. If the church has it and you can do it, that is fine. But my point is that sometimes we also go the other extreme. And because of this extreme, a lot of Christians and, and, and pastors, especially a lot of pastors who are not doing well in ministry, have become so frustrated now all they are preaching now is against other men of God. The fact that you have depressed or frustrated the ministry of things does not mean that you should now have what called a reverse hostility against other men of God to pull them down. That is also another extreme. So there's so much extreme, but the Bible says in Proverbs 11 1 that a, a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord. And now there's, there's so much false balance in the body of Christ when it comes to money. 
And because of that, based just upon that, because of these extremes, people living now say that money should not be given to the church. You don't understand. When it comes to money, I've said it before, study the New Testament. And remember, in the Old Testament, when God talks about poor, poor, number one, it was the Israel. Israel was a church, in quote, was a religious organization. And Israel was supposed to help each other. When strangers come in, they are supposed to help them as well. But the focus of the poor in the Old Testament was Israel, the people of God. Come to New Testament, do a survey from Matthew to Revelation. I've done it over, over and again. I'm a student of Bible and theology. The church, their main focus, anytime they were raising money, there were famine in other states. Agabus will prophesy about famine. Apostles Paul and always, okay, let us raise money for the church in this country, the church here, in Corinthians, in Macedonia. Anywhere in the Bible, the church was focusing the poor in the church, meeting the needy in the church. Of course, out of that, we affect communities. We affect nations, cities. Because through that also, the gospel is open, that we can press forth the gospel to nations. But God is number one interested about the church. You don't understand the ministry of the church. The church is the wife of Jesus or the wife of Jesus to be, the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. So do you think I wake up in the morning thinking about all, all the wives of the all wives in the world? I, I spend my, all my time thinking, oh, uh, all the wives in the world, how can I help you your need? I don't do that, sorry. When I wake up I, and I think about a wife, I think of one. My focus is my wife, not other wives. If there's a possibility to, to help some uh, wives, some wives, uh, and the same thing, the church is the wife of Jesus. And Jesus is passionate, efficaciously. The blood of Jesus is only effic is, is effective only on the church. Anybody who's not born again, the blood of Jesus will not profit him or her. The blood of Jesus is efficaciously on the church. That's why. Jesus is more interested about the church. But because of extreme, people are saying that even people should not give to the church. The money should be taken to the poor. And that is a spirit of Antichrist, which I've preached. It's on the YouTube. Go for my. The spirit of Antichrist wants to emphasize giving to the poor or the needy or humanitarian mission at the expense of the Lordship and the blood of Jesus. And people think that by just giving to the poor, you can become a Christian. I try to, will, a Muslim will not accept this, that by giving to the poor, you become a Muslim. No, no, no. You become first a Muslim, believe in Allah and his prophet Muhammad. Then you practice the five pillars in the Islamic religion, one of which is alms giving. You don't start by the giving. It doesn't work in any religion. But it's amazing, with that, this simple critical thinking, Christians believe that you can just give and that makes you a religious person. An atheist will not believe that. Tell an atheist that because you gave to a humanitarian need or agenda, I'm no more an atheist, I'm a Christian. No atheist will believe that. Critical thinking is out of critical thinking, in the perimeters of critical thinking. Anyway, I want to run up. So, argument from silence. You cannot argue that because Matt was not spoken about tight in the New Testament, that means it's abolished. Google. And Google argument from silence, and you get the concept I'm talking about. You cannot do such a conclusion. It is a fallacy conclusion. Two. With that much money, the church cannot accomplish much. And I've said that in the Bible, grace asks for more. The New Testament under grace does ne never ask for less of the law. The law helps as a guide. It helps. That's what the Bible says. The law is like a track, racing track. The Bible says the law is our tutor, our schoolmaster. So grace asks for more. I've told you that Israel was a theocratic nation as well as, as a religious nation. And the law is in three dimensions or three components. All right. So let me show you some scriptures. Matthew chapter 5, 17 to 19. I'm paraphrasing them. It says that, verse 19, those that teach the law, Jesus said it, and practice the law, they are great in the kingdom. You see, just because it's in, in the, in the New Testament, 
they are those who teach the law and practice the law. They are the greatest in the kingdom. He said that those he said those who teach but they don't practice it, they are least in the kingdom of God. In other words, it implies that the law is still upheld by Jesus. I've told you that in the under the New Testament, the law is still the moral law. Verse 17. Jesus said, verse 17, I did not come to put an end to the law. So that's not his purpose. So I didn't come to abolish the law. Verse 17, Matthew chapter 5, evidence. Law students will give evidence. If it is in law, I'll give you statutes or cases under the uh, U, uh, United Kingdom law or English, what's called the English legal system. But under the Bible, we support evidence, good interpretation and application. Verse 18. The law will only be passed away when the earth and heaven passes away. So long as earth is in existence and you on you and me we're on planet earth, the law is still applicable. Now Matthew 23, 23. Jesus spoke about two laws in Matthew 23, 23. As I've said, confessionalization. I've already told that the law can be classified in three components, three divisions. If you don't understand that in the Old Testament, that's why our argument is shallow. It has no foundation in the Bible. And we are passionate about it, but it is based upon false guilt. You see? You can believe that, oh, no, woman should not make up makeups, and you can kill people for that. But God will not say, because you were passionate about it, and you were so sentimental, so I accept it. You committed, you didn't do anything for God. Just like Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul thought he was doing God a favor. Following, helping, kill, and arrest Christians. And Jesus met, and Jesus Christ said to him, say, why are you hurting me? I told about the church, the body. People don't understand what the church is. The mystery and the fusion. One of my books is coming. I'm also writing a book about this. I, I don't practice tightening, giving 10%. I practice giving more than 10%. Because the church is the focus of Jesus. Jesus said, why are you hurting me, Apostle Paul? You are, you are, and Apostle Paul said, who are you? I'm not, I'm not hurting you. He said, don't you understand that what you do to the church, the church is my body, the body of Christ. So anything that affects the church affects me, Jesus. That's why Jesus is so passionate about the church. That's why the money cannot go outside. It comes to the church. Any person that teaches that the money should not come to the church is trying to say that he doesn't care about Jesus and the body of Jesus. And number one, Jesus Christ's number one priority is not the world. It is the church. Because efficaciously, the blood of Jesus is, up, up, is manifested in those who receive Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior. Matthew 23, 23. So two types of law. Ceremonial law and moral law. What did Jesus say about them? Matthew 23, 23. Jesus Christ said that the moral law, justice, truth, kindness, love, he said it is, the, it is more important than the ceremonial law, which is tight. He talked about tithing and offering. Now, in English, when I say something is more than some other thing, more important, English, what does it mean? We are comparing two things. Comparing. If I said, my first son is more or is better, is more good at this than my other son. It does not mean that my second son is not good. It means that that English implies that the ceremonial law is good. It's important. Just Christ said that the moral law, love, justice, is more important than the tithe. It implies the tithe is important. This affirmation. If you don't understand me as a Christian, go, to, go and see every an unbeliever who doesn't know anything about the Bible and ask him to just interpret that English. That when I say that, justice and love is more important than tight. What does that, what does that say to tight? What does it speak about tight? It speaks volumes that tight is important. So anybody who tells you that tight is past, I don't know where he's coming from. I don't know the Bible he's reading. And I don't know the scripture he's reading. All because we have messed up 
the Old Testament law. We don't understand it. In Romans, Bible said the law is good. Apostle Paul, no, Romans 7, Romans 8, Paul, Apostle, Paul, Apostle Paul was struggling in his pre-Christian, not when he was a pre-Christian, before he said that, when I was not a Christian, I wanted to do good, I'm not able to do. But the wrong I don't want to do, I found myself, and he said, and the, then the conclusion was that the law is good, Apostle Paul in Romans 6, the law is good, but there was another law, that's what I'm saying, that contextualization, the other law was not about the law of God. It was the, uh, the law of sin and death. It's called flesh. The law of sin and death is another law. And Paul says that that law entangled the law of God. And because it entangled the law of God, that law of God was supposed to direct me to Jesus, was di direct me to give tithes and do it well. But instead of me not fornicating, I was fornicating. Instead of me not I was telling, because the law was disabled, was influenced by Ebola or AIDS, if there was a problem. The law is good, but it has been touched, affected. And because of that, the law was not able to empower me to do what God wants me to do. But rather, when you become a Christian, grace empowers you to do what the law demands of you. That's why grace wants you to do more. Because now we have the power. We have the anointing to do what God wants us to do. We can overcome everything to the glory of God and by the grace of God. Since I've become a Christian, I've never spent one minute thinking about sin. Not one. I married as a virgin. Not one. So my point is that, and I don't have a problem. Yes, I see beautiful ladies all over the world. Beautiful. But I never spend a minute thinking and contemplating, oh, this lady, how can I meet the person? I don't have time. Why? Because the law is in my heart. And grace expects me to do more. And grace empowers me. Grace is God's source of power. That embraces and enables. It brings about facilitation. Grace will empower you to do things. Grace is not just uh, some ling lingo or some cliche. Grace is God's source of power. Grace will empower you. Grace will strengthen you to do what the Lord demands you to do. Because the law is still good. Tight is still good, but it is the minimum. So let me just run it up. I've said the run up a lot, isn't it? So let me show you in the grace and giving. Let me give you scriptures. No, I'll show you about Jesus. Jesus Christ said in Luke 10 7, say the preacher is worthy of his wages. Preachers have the right to be paid, to be given money. Oh, God. Apostle Paul, there are some places he will tell you to a particular church, read the contest. He said, in some say, I, I did business, tent making. To support myself. Why? Because you are dealing in a particular culture, he has to be careful. It's called common sense. Then the same Apostle Paul, at that place, he says, Oh, this church, you were the one who supported me. You, were, you went even beyond your means. And other places that say you have done well. So you see Apostle Paul being supported by the church in some areas. But some areas, he had to be smart because he didn't want his receiving from them hinder the gospel. Like, you go, like in Africa, people go into the buses and go and preach and they take offering. When I became born again, we, we go into the bus, we want to move from another city to another city, not because we want to travel, but because we want to get the opportunity to preach in the bus. So we tell the conductor, I'm going to this next city, but my purpose is, is to preach. So if you allow me to preach, then I'll pay for the fare. Then I will preach. But now people preach the gospel and take offering on the street. And I'm not sure they are born again. These are business. These are some of the extreme in the church. So let me conclude with the grace of giving. Grace and giving. Look at grace. Say that give more than grace expects you to give more under the law. And grace empowers you to do what the law requires of you. Acts 2, 42 to 47. Let me paraphrase them. Verse 44. Believers had everything in common. They share among them. Say believers. Remember, I told that God's in interest on my wife about Christian believers sharing. Number one, two, verse 45. They sold property and possession to give to anyone who had need. Talk about the Christians. And I ask you the question. Do you know what it means to sell a house in the UK? We're talking about at least 250,000 pounds and you give it. Have you given 250,000 to your church before? You are talking about tithe, which could be uh, in a month or in the whole year. In the whole year, a tithe of somebody could be 600 pounds or 300 pounds or 150 pounds. 
That is the tithe. And people are giving 250,000 per selling land, possession, and giving to the church. Have you given 250? Listen, I say to the church. Why, 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 why do we give to the church? There are two basic reasons. Number one, so that the mission of the church, in terms of mission, gospel preaching, whatever, uh, rent, uh, uh, rent bills will be paid for. That's number one. Two, so that the pastors, the ministers will be paid, taken care of. Right from old time, that's the purpose of the tithe and the offerings in the Bible. Look at 45, so their property. Why? Because there was grace. Look at Acts chapter 4, 32 to 36. Acts chapter 32. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 46. Verse 34. From time to time, the believers sold their houses. From time to time, they sold it. Time to, not just once. In other words, continuity. Time to time is continuity. Verse 45. The distribution were done by the apostles. The distribution was not, the money was not put on the street. Or for the individuals to go and give it to people on the street. No, no, no. The distribution was done by the church, the leadership of the church, by the apostles. In Acts chapter 6, we saw there that distribution were given to the, the Gentile believers and uh, the women, the widows, and the Jewish believers. And there was a lot of discrepancy and some uh, conf conflict. And the apostles said, no, no, this is not our call. We want to choose deacons, administrators. Who work on this because our calling is prayer and the and uh, ministering of the word so you see how they, are, they were more concerned about giving to the church so monies were brought in the church and they were able to help the wid widows it's not individuals going on the street to give their money it's not biblical look in the grace verse 33 look at verse 33 and god's grace was at work in all of them the effect was that Generosity, general, generous, generosity, generosity, or giving more than the tithe. In verse thirty, the Bible says that now there was grace in the church, and when there was grace, do you know what happened? There was a ripple effect. The grace of giving. The Bible talks about one of the gifts of the Spirit. One day I'll do my teaching that there are no, there is not nine gifts of the Spirit in the Bible. There is more. You see, you can only say. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are nine gifts of the Spirit. But in the Bible, in the New Testament, there are more than nine gifts. And when you study it, one of the gifts is the grace of giving. The grace of giving. There are some people, when they come to church, they don't want to go to much prayer meeting. All they want is pastor tell us about their project. And they are ready to give. And I like such people as well, as well. As people who pray and who also go to evangelism. Because money can become a vehicle to the gospel of the kingdom. So when there was grace, people were not giving 200, and people were giving 250,000 pounds and con con bringing it into a contemporary situation. <laughs> and because there was grace, look at grace, I told that grace demands more. Ananias chapter 5, Ananias and Cornelius. Apparently, they pledge because if I have my intent and I sell it and I want to go and give 50%, it's up to me. But what was going on? People were pledging. Oh, pastor, I'm also going to sell my, my land. And when the money comes, I'll bring it to you. And an essence of it. Apparently, look at the contest. So they also with their possession. And what? After pledging, they decide to keep some. And what happened? Look at that grace. Look at that grace. God killed them. They died. It is God. So tell me that grace and law, which one demands more? Which one is harsh? Grace. But just that grace will empower you to do the good thing, the right thing, unless you are a fake Christian. As much as there are fake pastors, there are also many fake Christians. They are fake. Many fake Christians. Look, ask the church of Corinthians. In the church of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul speaks to the church of Corinthians and he tells them about the church of Macedonia. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 from verse 1. Verse 1. He said that the grace of giving was upon the churches of Macedonia. Grace of giving. Verse 2. He said they were generous. The word generosity means more. They were generous. No way. They were giving more. In, when it comes to Jesus and the apostles, even Jesus, 
Jesus even was expecting the rich man to give more. So in comparison to the widow, my, he said the widow has given more. You see, more. The language of Jesus and the apostles was not give little. The language of the apostles and Jesus was give more to the church, the right church. So if you think you are in the church and it's not correct, you don't believe in your pastor, leave the church. It's that simple. I don't know why you, you follow, you are supposed to follow a leader. So why do you follow somebody you don't trust? If the person is a crook, you leave the person. It's the best principle. So second question, we see in Bible, verse 3, Bible says that they went beyond their ability. Uh, they went beyond what they were even able to do. Beyond. As I've said, when we started our church, I had a car, I had a car. When we started our ministry many years ago, over 20 years ago, I sold my car. I used to buy a mini church bus that takes about 15 people. Goes around picking people to church. A time came, we needed to lease a property and we need a down payment and the church didn't have money i had a car what did i do and it was it was my wife and i had a car one car it was finance in the in western we say finance means that it's like you borrow but you pay it monthly and it was twelve thousand pounds you can talk about seventy or sixteen thousand dollars we gave it to the church sold it and the money was used for the deposit so i'm a giver i give more than the tithe and I keep on giving. Right now, as I'm talking, by the grace of God, back somewhere in Africa, because of my family members, parents and the rest, I have one or two property. And my church, all our church people know that I personally, one of the reasons I want to sell a property because some of the money can be used to help the church. Why? Because the Bible wants us to give more, to go beyond our ability. So Paul says, the church of Messina went beyond their abilities. So, we don't move from one extreme to another extreme because some pastors are not doing the right thing. So, Christian, many Christians are also going to another extreme that no tightening, no giving to the church. And it's not biblical. It's based upon false premises. Verse 7. See, ask the churches of Corinthians to excel in their grace of giving. In other words, to give more. Apostle Paul didn't say, oh, tell them not to give because they are not. He said, ask, he asked the church of Corinthians to give more. Verse 7, it is there. Second Corinthians chapter 9, look at from verse 6. Look at what is there. Verse 6, he said they should be generous in their giving. Verse 8, he said God will bless you abundantly. Listen, he said God. And look at what the word blessing means. He said in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you you will be you will be able to do every good work see so is it because people are manipulating blessing people are, i know people are past a lot of matter we manipulate understand that because people are manipulating are you going to throw away this scripture verse 8 second creator said that when we give we'll be blessed abundantly then our all our needs will be met then we'll be able to do good works more but say more we can't throw this scripture away just because that's extreme. That is also another extreme. Look at verse 10. There is supply and increase in your giving. It says it. We can't throw that scripture away. It is Bible. In under grace, God expects supply to the believers and he expects increase. Look at verse 12. No, verse 11. See, Paul expects believers to be generous. As God enriched them in every way, as God enriched them in every way, in every way, in every aspect, whether your business, your job, your career, your whatever. God says, as God blesses you, God expects Christians to be generous. Generous means more, give more. That is why I don't practice tithe. I practice me giving more than ten percent. Any Christian who practices tithe is just a baby Christian. Any matured Christian who pays not more than tithe is not matured yet. If you are matured, you see, I be, I'm believing God, I'm praying that God will bless me with businesses, investment. And so that in future, I can live on maximum, on, I will live on 10% and give over 90% to the church and to the kingdom of God. That is my goal. That is my passion. My goal is not, how can I give less than 10%? It's not Bible. 
verse 12, people will resort in thanksgiving to God. He said, by our giving and missions taking place, and the money is being used for missions, using to help people get so safe. He said, by so doing, people are going to give thanks to God and say, God, because of him, because of his contribution to the church, because of what he did, out of my wife and I, our sacrifice, Many people have been born again. Many people have seen and uh, known Jesus Christ. A lot of lives have been, even as we have received people, visitors who came from Romania and the rest, so who have to come and sleep even in our, uh, sitting, uh, in our sitting room. You see? And some of them are preachers. Some of them have their doctorate. They came to sleep in our sitting room. But it's out of our giving. Some of so even eventually, some of them need to go and rent a place. My, we have to give a money that was at the end of the month he was not able to pay us then one guy then was we have to pay our rent we couldn't pay because he has not yet paid us we have helped people but in so doing this man who has got his church now he has phd in theology when they open their mouths when they give thanks they are thank god for this young man joe for what he did in our lives so i suppose that our giving will bring about ripple effect Chain reaction. Chain interventions. Because you have done it, it will cause other people to do it. And there will be thanksgiving. That's why in the early church, there was more grace. When there was grace, people were giving more than thanks. So in my conclusion, when there's much finance in the church, more can be done. One of the agenda of the Satan, if I were Satan, I wouldn't want much money to come to the church. Because if the church has much money, the church can accomplish more. The church can do more. People who know me in our church, in our church, our friends, people, family, they will tell you, I am an extravagant giver. I am passionate giver. Before I got married, any money I get was in my pocket, cash and carry. It takes one or two days for the money to go. When you marry a family, at least you have to be uh, think better. Rents must be paid, children must be cared for. <laughs> so, beloved, for seekers of truth, this is for seekers of truth. There are a lot of people who want the truth, but just that we are not having the truth because we have not had people whom God have anointed. Not only that, people like me who have studied theology, law, psychotherapy, and other things. I've studied, if you have certificates for football in this nation, I have certificates for business, I have certificates for uh, healthy eating, dietary. You know, any opportunity I get, I study. I like to study. I'm talking about qualifications. I'm talking about qualifications. I have qualifications on different certificates you can think about. So when I talk, I don't talk because I want one person to feel bad or not. But it's because God has blessed me spiritually and called me as an apostle to bring order, a paradigm shift, an understanding to the body of Christ. And if you're a seeker of truth, go through it. Any point you don't understand, make put forth questions. You can say, I don't agree with you. I disagree with this. Give your argument. I'll respond. Any argument, I'll put this on Facebook, I'll put it on YouTube. Any question you put down for, I'll respond to it. I'll respond with critical thinking, argument. Listen, an argument must have one goal, only one goal, not two. Two, an argument must have at least one reason. One reason. Why? Why? Because then, if possible, you back it with evidence and example. And that's what I would do. When you put forth your questions, I will state the goal, but my point, I'll give you multiple reasons, at least one reason, then I'll back it with evidence and example. If there's more in the church, the church will do more. The early church never advocate for less giving. They advocate for more giving. Why? Because they were trustworthy. If that's why you shouldn't be in an organization where that is not trustworthy, why will you do it? Even that even tells that even speaks a volume about you. That organization you don't trust belong to an organization you trust. 
groups you trust, places that you can flourish, places that you can do more for God, so that the kingdom of God will expand. Beloved, we are the last days. If you see some of my clothes, you are the last days. In the last days, the one number one agenda of the spirit of Antichrist to make sure that there's no money in the body of Christ. As extremes among pastors, also extreme among church members. They are all false balance. The balances stay in the middle. Let's stick to the word of God. Let's use Bible commentaries. Let's expand the kingdom of God. Let's love God. I'm writing a book on this topic I'm giving to you. And at the right time, you see, you see the book on Amazon or on my Facebook, wherever. And I may the Lord God Almighty be glorified. May Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, may he receive the reward of his suffering. May men of God, genuinely called by God, who are genuinely wants to know the, I mean, do the right thing. Even when they are making the wrong thing, may God help them to do the right thing. And may we all, who also who are gone to one stream, other pastors or church people, may we come back to the right stream, instead of extremes, right stream. Passionate for God, loving God, doing the work of God, bringing glory to God. Bible says everything that we do, we should do to God's glory. Don't listen to ministers who are frustrated and depressed and people who are hurt in the church going about putting forth false doctrines and exegesis. It's not correct. Bring any question they have, put them or organize a debate for us. I'll be ready for that. I, 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 what you call apologetics. I'll be ready to debate it from every angle based upon what they say in Jesus' name. More grace to you. Grace, more grace. Grace is good. Grace, grace, grace. That is why I don't practice tight. I practice giving more than 10%. I don't practice giving 10%. I practice giving more than 10% to the church, not on the street, to the church, the, the body of Christ. God says that you touch my body. You have touched me. Paul, Paul, you have touched me. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen.